Thank you so much for joining us today at Rachel Ray's Yummo Cooking Camp. Wait, what's that? Oh, camp director wants to say something and because she's the camp director, when she wants to speak, it's her prerogative. So here's a short message from our camp director, Rachel Ray. Chef Alex, hi Alex. Alex Garnaschelli is our guest counselor today, everybody. I hope you're as psyched for camp as I am. First of all, I was so excited when I saw what Chef is going to be cooking with today. Corn is one of my favorite things in the whole world. And there's a picture of me when I was a baby in a high chair and I had fallen asleep with a corn cob hanging out of my mouth, still gnawing on it because my mother couldn't pry it away from me without me having a complete fit. It's sweet, it's delicious, as is uh, most everything that Chef Alex makes, very delicious. Alex, you're a dear friend for doing this. Thank you for being our counselor today. Take it away. Thank you so much, Rachel. I know that feeling about corn. I'm right there with you. Okay, campers, you guys have been super patient, and that means it's time to introduce our guest camp counselor. Everyone, please welcome Iron Chef Alex Gornashali. Alex, how are you? Hello, campers. So psyched that you are here with us today. Thank you for taking a beautiful Saturday afternoon to be with us. We have thousands of campers from all over the world who have set aside this time to learn everything that you're going to teach. So thanks so much. And oh, I think amazing. what we ought to do, why don't you walk us through what it is that we are going to be doing and maybe what we should have out on our counters already. So I actually thought I'd start. I know you think chefs don't cook with recipes, <laughs> but we actually do. Um, so we're gonna make two things today. There, I, I, I just, there's so many ways to eat and cook corn that I just couldn't make up my mind. Um, so we're gonna make a summery corn soup, which you, I'm recommending you serve chilled. You can serve it hot. You could, pour some grilled shrimp or lobster or grilled vegetables in a bowl and just pour the corn soup over it and serve it warm. Sometimes I find when it's really hot out and I go to the beach, I come back and I'm kind of cold. Mm. So this is a soup. It's like a little black dress in your closet. You can serve it hot, cold, whatever you want. And that's going to be put together very easily with some corn and scallions and just like some little flavor tweaks. Um, so in that recipe, we have a little bit of olive oil that we're going to need some scallions uh if you don't have scallions you could use a leek you could use um, a yellow onion you could use a white onion any little kind of onion form you could even use a bunch of chives chopped up it'd be perfectly cool um eight ears of corn i have some peeled i have some unpeeled we'll, we'll talk about corn in a few minutes some dark brown sugar I like there to be like a sweet note, you know, like a little, a little bit of sweetness and the brown sugar really does that. Some black pepper or pepper you have in a pepper mill will need salt. I use kosher salt, big fan. Um, some half and half, which is not exactly half milk and half cream, but basically kind of, mm -hmm. sort of. So you could use, you know, uh, two cups of milk and a little tub of sour cream. You could use three and a half cups of half and half. You could use half cream, half milk. Um, you do need some richness in there though. For example, skim milk, all skim milk just won't do the trick. So at least some of something kind of creamy. And the tiniest dash of Tabasco or any kind of hot sauce that you like. The soup is not spicy. It just has that little like a dash of uh, Tabasco or hot sauce can lift flavors up without making the dish spicy. And that's kind of what we're going for. Um, you could also just add more and make it spicy. There's nothing wrong with a little heat. So that is the first dish, our summery corn soup. And then the next dish is kind of more playful, I feel like. Maybe the soups for the adults and the fritters are for the kids, some corn fritters. Um, and we're really essentially gonna make a batter, um, like a fritter batter. Um, with um, sugar, a little bit of sugar, a uh, little bit of baking powder, if you have that, two eggs, um, again, some milk. I'm going to be dairy heavy today. A um, little salt, a little cayenne pepper. Um, you can leave the cayenne out if you don't want that heat. You could add paprika. You could add sweet paprika. 
and just have it have a little tingle without being super spicy for the kids. We need a little all-purpose flour, um, four cups of cooked corn kernels. So these are corny, no pun intended. Um, and you can cheat with canned corn um, if you like. And I know you're thinking, really, Alex, it's the height of corn season. Why would we do that? And the answer is you need four cups. And it's okay to cheat a little bit on the test. So you could cut two cups of fresh corn and mix it with a little canned. You could do all canned or you could do all fresh. Um, obviously, the all fresh is fantastic. But again, I never like to set the bar so high that you say, I'm exhausted just reading the recipe. See you later. And then we'll need a pot with some oil in it. And I have that back here on the stove for frying those fritters. I say about a quart, I think a few cups would be okay, of a nice neutral oil with a forgiving smoke point like canola or grapeseed. No expensive olive oils need apply here. Um, and again, some brown sugar, you see a theme. Um, for those of you that are kid chefs that are cooking along, stuff tastes really good to you because you're a kid. But adults need a little extra assistance with the, oh, this tastes like my childhood. And we get there by way of sugar. That's just how you get there, just that pinch of sugar so we have a little bit more brown sugar. So that's kind of an overview. We're gonna make a batter and essentially mix all these ingredients together and then literally drop bits of it into the hot oil, fry them, season them, and you just eat them. You could, I, I don't really serve them with a dipping sauce, but you could. Um, I've eaten these with tartar sauce as if they're crab cakes. Um, I've eaten them just dunked in mayonnaise because I have no shame. Um, you know, you can do what you like, um, but you don't necessarily need a sauce. Um, so no pressure there. And my, my idea is to start with the soup. Um, I think that would be best. Will you pass me that corn over there? I actually don't so have enough getting corn those things together. Uh, campers, if there's anything on that long list. Yeah, clean some things. more corn. Yes. To go ahead more questions. And in the meantime, I will, uh, share one corny fact that I learned that the average ear of corn has 800 kernels. Did you That's know that? That's exhausting. No, I really didn't. In 16 rows. If you do the math, that's 50 kernels per row. That's one for every state. And I think we've oh got God. at least every state covered here today on this Zoom call. So that's cool. But I did get a question. How do you pick? Joey wants to know how you pick a good ear of corn. Yeah, well, that's why I left a few kind of um, in their husks, so to speak. Um, I know this may sound weird, Joey, but um, I'm a big touch person with in ingredients like this. Um, pick it up. It should be heavy. And I know you never think, okay, what's the big deal? But if you have a light ear of corn in your hand, now, if it's really small, of course, it's going to feel lighter. But if it, there's not a certain weight to it, it means it's dried out right then and there because it's lost its water. So you definitely want to go for the ears of corn that feel heavy. And the minute you touch something, you can all, almost feel you should feel a, a moisture to it. That's what you want to get into. Um, my father used to go and tear back a little of the husk and the silk and just look inside at the kernels. You can do a little kernel check without hurting the corn. Of course, if you're going to do that and not pick it, show some respect, put, the, put it back and, you know, put it back gently. Let the next person buy it. Um, if it doesn't look good to you, you want to see juicy plump kernels, not any evidence of drying on the ends. You can definitely tell on the top and the bottom and the silk up here if it's dry. What we really want to avoid is anything light or anything dry. Um, if you're not sure, that's when I'd tear down and take a little peek inside the building. Um, my corn fact for the day, Randy, is you know these annoying white little pieces, what we call the silk of the corn, that we never seem to be able to get all of it off? There is one piece of silk on every ear of corn for every kernel. Wow. So if there are 800 kernels, yeah. there are 800 pieces of this silk that that's we've got to clear away. And I'll actually clean an ear of corn and do and just show you a simple trick that I use to get that silk off there. Because you know when you're eating the corn and you're laughing and then all the strands <laughs> of silk are hanging down and you look like Dracula. We're going to try to avoid the Dracula corn look this summer. <laughs> How Other perfect. questions. Right. So I think what we should do is that people were screaming about how much they love to cook. I think we should dive right in. We've got two ambitious recipes. Let's start cooking, Alex. Okay, fantastic. So the first thing we're gonna do is get our soup together. 
Um, and this is a quick cooking and it comes together um, fairly rapidly, which is what I want in the summer. I have here six scallions and we're gonna cut white to green all the way up. We're gonna use all of it. This is nose to tail scallion eating. Um, if you're more comfortable just doing three scallions at a time, do that. And all we're doing now is just cutting the scallions into thin rounds, okay? Now I'm a righty. I pretend that I'm an eagle perched on a branch uh, overlooking the cliffs of America. One claw is perched on the scallions themselves. The other claw is grasping the knife. And really it's this motion. This hand is guiding how much this hand gets to cut, if that makes sense. I will never cut nice and easy. the same way again. I yeah, well, it. yeah, I think if you imagine yourself as a big, powerful, beautiful animal, you realize that what you're doing is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also something you've got to be really attentive to, especially kids. Um, I think my daughter cut her finger cutting a mushroom when she was about five, and I just thought I, either I'm the best mother for showing her how to cut something at five, or I'm the worst because she's wearing two Band-Aids on her index <laughs> finger right now. People were like, what happened? You know, like, are you, you know, you have your child locked in your restaurant. You can see that. <laughs> Here's the other thing. Um, so we're gonna take a couple tablespoons of olive oil and just put them in a, um, I know it's funny, you think soup, we need a soup pot. I honestly often make soups in a, in a skillet with a lot of surface area. So it cooks more quickly and so I can really see what's going on. Whenever I can see as much of what I'm doing as possible by having a pan in front of me, by having a big pan, I do it. I wanna watch things cook. Um, and let's cut the rest of our scallions. And don't stress if all the rounds aren't perfect. You know what I mean? It's gonna turn into soup. No one's gonna know. Here's why you wanna do them as thinly as you can. It cooks more quickly and it cooks better. And that's important for taste. So that's really all we care about. But we're not in a three-star Michelin restaurant and the Queen of England is not gonna eat your soup. It's just for you and your family. So try to take pleasure in these small tasks. Here's why I like scallions. First of all, in summertime, scallions are nice and thin and tender too. You know, the corn isn't the only one who's entering a beauty pageant in summer. So are scallions. You cut them, you have no scraps. They're a cheap date and they are less messy than peeling onions and whatever else. You'll notice there's no garlic in this soup. Um, I put garlic in everything, but garlic is so bossy. You know, it's that friend who just won't stop telling you how to live your life. That's how I look at garlic. And we don't need that right now. It's summer, we're relaxed. Put all those scallions into your pan with, those, with the oil. And these scallions are literally making me cry. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Um, little silly thing about a knife. Um, you chop with the blade, you've got this other side that's not sharp. I use that to gather things up on my board. Um, and that way you don't dull your knife by scraping an arm board. People are always asking me how you keep your knives sharp. A lot of how you keep your knives sharp, sharp is how you use them. So we cut with this side and then you turn it and with the non-sharp side, you use that as your broom to gather stuff up off your cutting board. A little silly thing keeps your knife sharper. And also you look really smart and chefy, which is super cool. Okay, the scallions are cut, they're in the oil. Let's give it a pinch of salt. Just a little pinch of kosher salt, my favorite kind of salt, medium heat. And just let's stir those scallions. And you just start to smell them immediately. By the way, I'm cooking on an induction burner just so you can see me more clearly. I will be going back to my stove a little bit later on, but I wanna try to face the camera as much as possible. Um, and we're just cooking these until they're nice and tender. Nothing in here but a little olive oil and a little salt. Corn. Um, so we're gonna get with eight ears for this. Do you guys have eight ears of corn just hanging around? Like, oh, hey, Alex, yeah, I just, I've got eight ears of corn. If you cheat a little bit with a can, I will never know. So feel free. Um, I'm gonna take a little bowl here. Maybe I'll use this one so you can see a little bit more clearly. 
and then I'm going to put, now you can do this a couple ways. I put a bowl inside a bowl like this. You can perch the corn on here and just cut it off the cob and have it fall in the bowl. Or you can literally just cut it right on the board. The trick actually is not to cut, but to gently saw so that the corn somewhat falls on the, on the board. Corn is a disobedient creature, and it can be um, because it is so beautiful. You know, it's like that, you know, it's like, it's like the Lady Gaga of ingredients. It, it just can do what it wants. So you can try my trick of a bowl inside a bowl. You try to cap it, catch it all you can into here. And we're just gently shaving down on all the rows. Don't cut too deep, because we don't want to take a lot of that inner husk with us. We really just want the kernels. You see that? And if you, if you have a row that's a little uneven, just go back and just shave a little bit more to clean that corn. Don't stress it. So right now, let's recap where we are. We have eight ears of corn that we are cutting off the cob. And in here, we have six scallions. Just gently cooking. I kind of lowered my heat now. It's kind of medium lowish with a pinch of salt and they're just getting nice and tender. Any questions about what we're doing or hostile comments or I can't well, believe no one's part. asked me about shop yet. Uh, not yet, but uh, actually they have, but I'm going to hold those until the end. But there was a question. Is there anything that you can do with those husks once they're, excuse me, the cobs, once you're done taking off? Oh, yeah. Cobs? Absolutely, and in fact, we're gonna do it for this recipe. So, you see I'm just cutting it off, and you're right. We have um, the husks, right? And we're literally gonna take them and put them in a pot, and we're gonna make a little stock. And this is really probably the best thing you can do with the corn. Sorry, just grabbing another pot. Corn cob stock. So we're gonna take a, a pot, any kind, and just drop your husks once they're cleaned in the pot. Now you should be collecting your corn, just cutting it off the cob. And then what we're gonna do is for the liquid part of this soup, we're gonna actually turn it into a little corn stock. Oh, this is so juicy. This is a great moment for corn, which is why I picked it. I think a cooking camp is a place where you also um, cook with something that's really in season. This is the moment for corn, and we're going for it. So you'll see lower down in your recipe, I have three to three and a half cups of half and half. Let's take your corn cobs cleaned, right? We have our kernels over here, our cleaned cobs and pour that half and half right over the cobs. And pop that on the stove, low heat, nice and easy. And we're gonna milk the flavor out of those husks and get it into our soup and then into our bellies instead of in the garbage. And this is really the best thing you can do with the leftover husks is steep them in something. They're, they're almost like nature's tea bag, and you steep them to get that flavor into the soup. It's gonna reinforce the actual corn. Now, I, my bowl's getting kind of full, and I've only cut four cobs, or even three. So when that happens, you know, preserve your corn that's cut. Don't keep your kind of cutting bowl too full. So feel free to empty that, and just keep going. I want to kind of go back for a second. And by the way, I've lowered the scallions. You'll see in the recipe, I have a quarter cup of water. Just add that to your scallions. And that kind of buys you a few minutes. The scallions have a little liquid to play with and they're happy. Let's talk for a second, just about the most essential part really, which is how do you clean an ear of corn? And corn is messy, you know? and it's worth it. Go down into your, the top of your ear and peel it and try to get your hands as much underneath that silk 
and as close to the kernels as you can and pull straight towards you and down. And this corn is so fresh, the husk doesn't want to come off. By the way, that's another sign of really fresh corn. When the husk gives you a street fight, it will be removed. Now what I do is I clean all the corn. Don't stress the little bits of silk yet. First, you, you know, it's like you come home, you're tired. First, you take off your coat and your scarf and your hat. Then you worry about your other clothes. First, just tear off all the outer layers and, as, and get it, as much of that silk, those little white filaments off as you go. Questions about this? And this smells so good. It smells like lying down on a grass in the summer, which just, when I cook corn, it makes me just, I eat like three additional ears just because it smells so good as you're cleaning it. So let's recap for a second. I'm putting my cut cobs, my cleaned cobs in a pot with the three to three and a half cups of half and half. And I've got that on very low heat. Over here, I have my two cups of olive oil. Sorry, I have my two tablespoons, two cups of olive oil and my six scallions. It's cut into thin rounds. It's amazing how hey, clean. Yeah. Uh, Kara in New Orleans wants to know, is there any use for all that silk? Have you ever experimented with that? Kara, I love you. <laughs> I have and no. Sometimes you got to say something's trash. Yeah. Um, well, you can cook the corn, you know, in the husks themselves and benefit from the juiciness and the sort of protectiveness that the silk has as it cooks the ear, if you like that kind of steamed, pure corn taste. So it can be like a winter coat if it's to the corn, if it's cold outside. Um, I've tried everything, Kara. I've tried deep frying that. I've really, I've gone the distance. And I gotta say, let me save you some time. Um, sometimes things are just, you know, trash. You gotta um, know when to hold them and you gotta know when to fold them, Alex. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, what is it? You never count your money when you're sitting at the table? At the table, yeah. yeah. Be plenty of time for counting. So here I have my somewhat cleaned ears of corn. And then what I do is I grab a kitchen towel, cloth, any kind. I'm actually gonna turn down my scallions. Once they're tender and the water is somewhat cooked out, and just with a wet towel, wipe them down. And that will really remove a lot of that silk that you couldn't get off when you were just peeling the corn. So you can kind of wipe it. It's almost like polishing a shoe with a cloth. And that will get rid of a lot of that silk. This is really, and just lightly dampened, you know, a cheap kitchen towel will do it. Preferably a little, one with a little texture. If you've got those fancy pants, um, smooth kitchen towels like this, like I have a, this is kind of, kind of a fancy, but it doesn't have that kind of bath towel vibe. This is kind of a cheaper towel from the supermarket and it's just so much more useful. And just gently wipe that silk off the outside of the corn itself. Um, there are a lot of different types of corn, right? Varieties, like there are varieties of apple, there are varieties of corn. So there's white corn, there's yellow corn, there's different types. We grow some um, in this part of the country called Silver Queen, one of my favorites. Um, you don't realize, for example, there are 60 types of porcini mushrooms. So when you go to a, um, a restaurant, you say, I'll have the porcini mushroom ravioli. You're ordering a mushroom that actually exists in 60 varieties. So let me tell you. Vegetables are a miraculous thing. Um, we're still cutting corn. I showed you how to clean it. We talked about that silk. Don't worry about it if for the soup there's a little bit of silk. Don't stress it. It's all, it all tastes like corn. And we're just cutting down all the cobs. Other questions? Yeah, uh, there, there was a question. When you were using the dairy product earlier, Alex, there was a question as to whether or not you could substitute a nut milk for the dairy. No, I mentioned that actually. 
Did I not? I think, yeah, you need the creaminess of a true milk for this. You could get away with coconut milk if dairy is your issue. The only thing I want to warn you about with coconut milk is that it's surprisingly sweet, coconut milk. It sneaks up on you. So watch the sweetness of the soup. You may want to add a little bit of extra pepper or salt to make sure that the soup stays savory. So a sub, you'd be better with coconut milk than with a nut milk for this. I love nut milk, just not here. Let me Great question. Quick, let me do a quick shout out. As I mentioned earlier, we're really proud to have the Boys and Girls Clubs of America as a partner and a beneficiary of this series. I want to give a special shout out today to the Boys and Girls Club of Patterson and Passaic in New Jersey. They have distributed 30,000 emergency food kits and get wow. this, 900,000 meals. That is oh my God. a blowing number. That's even more people than we have watching today. I mean, that's wow. So congratulations to you guys making the world a better place with your hard work and your passion. Uh, congratulations. Respect. Um, okay, so I've cut eight ears of corn. I'm gonna get my bowl out of here. Good trick, but getting the bowl out is another matter, right? Clean that off and let's put all the corn in the pan with the scallions. So all that cut corn, all eight ears, right in there. I'm gonna wash my hands, give them a rinse. Like some people want to know if you have ever cooked with purple corn, um, and if so, is there a taste difference with purple corn? Um, I find a texture difference more than anything generally. I find that this, and it also depends on what time of year. You know, this is the height of the season for corn. So the corn is extra specially tender. Um, I find purple corn can be a little tougher, a little more toothy, a little more starchy um, than most types of white or yellow corn, but I love them all. And in fact, I love, I get a lot of popcorn and blue corn from South Carolina that is just to die for. And I make blue corn meal, you know, anything. I make blue grits, uh, cornbread, whatever, you name it. Um, and there's a really great meal called Geechee Boy, G-E-E-C-H-I-E, -E -E, Geechee Boy um, in South Carolina. When I call to order corn meal and grits from him, he often has to shut off his tractor <laughs> to take my order. And that's my kind of person. You know what I'm saying? Let's add to this um, our little, you'll see I had some little seasonings in there. Two tablespoons of dark brown sugar that I added in there. Um, a tablespoon of Worcestershire and just a teaspoon, tiny splash of Tabasco and a little crack of pepper. Okay. We've got our um, half and half and corn husks simmering gently on the stove. And this, I'm barely going to cook it, honestly. Look at it. It should be melting in with those scallions. You want that brown sugar we just added and the Worcestershire and Tabasco to dissolve into the corn itself a little bit, right? If you can see that, it should be mixing with the scallions. Don't be afraid to get underneath and pull those scallions up and get that corn. Put the heat back up a little bit, kind of medium-ish. Let's take a look at our corn stock that we made. You can see that I have more husks than I do liquid, doesn't matter. If I filled this up to cover the husks, I would make a quart and a half of not so husky, not so flavorful stock. Better that you have less liquid steeped in more husks with more taste, if that makes sense. And so I've got that kind of on standby and I'm actually just with a minute or so of cooking this corn like this, I'm gonna pour that liquid right over it and just hold on to the husks so they stay in the in the pan, right? Campers, this is a good time to ask for help if you're unsure about that hot oh, yeah. over the Make stove. Your pan. Are you kidding me? This is sure. so time for mom, dad, grandma, yeah, your aunt, your uncle, your... You just pour all that liquid right over the corn. The husks have now been 
politely robbed of their really good corn taste. And you can see that we're kind of at soup. Just right now, let's add a pinch of salt. Let's let this heat a minute. And we're actually gonna put only a little bit of it in the blender. First, we'll bring it to a boil, and then we'll blend a little bit of it and pour it back in. We're gonna leave this soup nice and chunky, but here's a great trick. If you have a soup, a minestrone, lentil, split pea, whatever it is, bean soup, and it's, it's a little thin, take a few cups of the soup and blend it with the beans and everything or the corn or the peas or whatever and make it smooth and pour that smooth blended bit back into your soup, whisk, and it'll magically thicken all of your soup. And you don't need cornstarch and flour and arrowroot and agar agar and mysterious potions. It's just a little bit of thickening by pureeing some of what you're making. So the same flavors are intensified and the textures improved. Questions, is a good time campers to taste? Now we taste, do we need salt? Do we want another little dash of Worcestershire in there? Do we want a tiny pinch of sugar? So give it a little stir. Mm. Oh yeah, okay Summer. I wish I could take credit for making this soup, but the ingredient and this time of year, it kind of makes itself. Um, so I'm gonna take just a little bit of that soup and puree it and pour it back in just to give it a little bit of body, but leave some of the texture of that corn and those scallions. So here I've got a cup measure. I'll take say, I don't know, two-ish cups out of there. Uh, campers, never fill a blender higher than half with anything hot. Definitely ask your parents for help. When I'm blending hot, I actually take this little piece, and only when thousands of people are watching, out so that steam can escape. And I put a towel, cover the blender, and I put a little towel over it. I can kind of regulate. So this is, the blender stance, I call it. You are ready. Both my hands are engaged. It's about safety, because this is a great um, tool, the blender. But, you know, you need the blender knows you're in charge. That's a big part of safety, is actually confidence. Having the confidence to do this is a big part of staying safe in the kitchen. And uh, it took me a long time to learn that. So maybe if I just keep saying it out loud, other people will get on the bandwagon. I'm gonna put my soup right on top here. I'll keep it covered kind of, but I'm holding it. And then I'm gonna put the blender on nice and low. There's no need to go crazy, nice and easy. It's also safer. And then you see now I'm blending and I'm letting that steam escape through the hole so that the blender is not grumpy and the corn is just pureeing. And this doesn't have to be perfectly smooth. What we're doing is creating a tiny bit of the liquid more thick, down by the starch and the pureed corn. We've got the rest of the soup here. Alex, people are wanting to know if they can use an immersion blender as opposed to that. Oh yeah, sure. You can just okay. stick an immersion blender in there. Great. I just, I wish I liked an immersion blender. I know I really should. I want to invent one that I really like. Um, but I do, I will say if you have a blender, blending it is smoother and quicker and easier. Here with the blender, with the immersion blender, you're, you can puree all of the corn a little bit instead of really pureeing some of it and leaving some of it whole. My case for busting out the blender. <laughs> Pour that thickened, smooth corn back in there and the soup is finished. So that's really good. And then we just let that, what I like to do is I make the soup, right? I stir it. And I actually just let it sit off the heat for like 10 or 15 minutes and just cool a little bit. Then I go back and taste it and then I decide. You can either ladle it into bowls hot and throw some shrimp in there to make it you know, beefier if you want or whatever, some sauteed fish, anything. Or you can chill it and serve it chilled. Just pop the whole thing in the fridge. Wow. Questions Great. about that. Love that. Now, listen, I know people call you an iron chef, but maybe we have to start calling you a corn whisperer with all that. Yes, so oh. I would like to I would like to be called this. This is fantastic. Now <laughs> let's get to our fritters. 
And I love that my camp class is a little over ambitious. So for that, we have four cups of cooked corn, right? Already cooked and cooled, ideally, to make the batter. And we're just gonna kind of put this batter together. Now I have behind me, here on the stove, a pot with some oil, and I'm kind of monitoring the temperature, right? I have that at about, you want it about 350 to fry those fritters. Definitely recruit your parents, your uncle, your aunt, your neighbor, your cousins to help you out with this part. And we're literally just gonna mix this batter in a bowl. This is pretty easy. Two tablespoons of sugar, one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, crack two eggs in there, large eggs if you have them. Just right in there, the whole egg, one, two. We're gonna add a half a cup of whole milk. You could add whole coconut milk here, by the way, instead of whole milk. Pinch of salt, kosher salt, just add a little pinch in there. Half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. If you don't want any heat or tingle or anything, just don't put it, no biggie at all. Let's give this a whisk. Here's what I always say about any batter. Cake batter, donut batter, savory sweet. You can whisk ingredients as much as you want. We're gonna add three quarters of a cup of flour. When flour blows into town, we stop whisking. Flour does not like to go to the gym. It does <laughs> not like to work out. It does not wanna be whisk. This is the Beyonce of the dry ingredient world and we need to show her some respect. So in here, two tablespoons of sugar, one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, two eggs, just beating them up, two large eggs, half a cup of whole milk or coconut milk, and a pinch of salt. You notice how much I'm whisking? I don't care, right? Really get those mixed together. Particularly the eggs, you want the eggs all broken up, like you're scrambling them. When it looks like that, then we come into town with our flour. We have the cayenne in there too, sorry. Three quarters of a cup of flour just entered the building. When that happens, we just say, just break it up a little bit and just mix it enough. You'll see this will come together quickly, like a, a little bit of a loose batter, right? And we're gonna stir just enough. You see how it's kind of liquidy. And to that, I'm gonna add my four cups of cooked corn. It's a lot of corn. You're gonna say, Alex, are you nuts? And I'm gonna say, yes, I am. Mix. You see that? Kind of goopy. But it's not like someone's gonna say, hey, what, what ingredient are we cooking? I mean, hello? Have a little bit of flour on standby, just a little bit. Because sometimes I make my first fritter and it's a little loose, you just add a little more flour. That's the thing about flour. Um, it's a diva, but it's forgiving. So I'm gonna actually grab a touch more flour in case I feel I need it. Questions? Yes, Alex, I knew these were gonna come up since we're frying. A lot of questions about whether you can use a a deep fryer, air fryer, or bake these fritters? Could not, this unfortunately is not a baked type of batter. You okay. can make baked fritters. I'm making a batter you wanna fry. Um, an air fryer, I don't know, because I haven't tested the recipe. I, I hate to say it. Um, I bet it would work, but I can't, I can't corroborate the story because I haven't tested it myself. What can I say, people? I'm old school, man. I got a couple of, I got three cups of canola oil just heating gently on the flame. I know we have a lot of alternative and more healthy ways to do it, but boy, really? With this corn in the peak of summer, you guys want to air fry on me? I don't know. I need to rethink things. I really do. Uh, there is a question. Other questions. Why, why, uh, why not use corn oil since we're doing everything with corn? What would corn oil look like in this recipe? You can, but 
you tell me if you've got the palate that at 350 degrees, you can tell the taste of corn oil and call me. Because I'm going to have you replace me on Chopped as a judge. I was going to so say, that's you, a contestant for you. Yeah, the lightest oil, the lightest, would actually be peanut oil, which I never use because I'm always so afraid of allergies with, with, with guests or wherever I am. When someone says I have a nut allergy and I think, God, you know, the peanut oil ruins that for everything, but it's a great light oil for frying. I like canola because it forgives you. You can heat it too high and bring it back down. And it just kind of says, all right, all right, come on in anyway. I forgive you, even though you don't know how to heat me up. That's why I like it. It's a foolproof oil. You could totally use corn oil, very on brand. I want you to have a slotted spoon fitted with a towel, slotted for digging the fritters out of the oil and somewhere to land. Never fry without knowing where your landing strip is before you start. So I have this just hanging out next to my oil on the stove. And I literally put it next to it. So I drop stuff in the oil and I go, oh my God, where, where do I, oh, I'm right here. Make sense? It's like laying out your clothes the night before school. Uh, I, I did it one fourth of the time, but the days that I had my outfit out, I was like, I am ready for everything. So my batter's, by the way, looking a little loose. I'm gonna add, um, let's say another quarter cup of flour. <coughs> Excuse me. And even I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add another half a cup of flour. And sometimes I do this, sometimes I don't. It depends on how watery the corn is. It, it can vary. But you want your batter to give you a little resistance and you want to feel like the batter is sticking to those pieces of corn and that it's kind of tacky. Like almost like, a, when you first add Rice Krispie treat, Rice Krispies to the marshmallow and you're mixing that kind of beginning sticky feeling. I'm trying to make an analogy. I have three tablespoons of brown sugar on standby, just because we'll sprinkle this with a little bit of salt and brown sugar when they come out. That's what I put on top. So you bite in and there's this salty, sweet kind of vibe going on. Questions? Love that. Uh, listen, there was a general question that uh, has been asked a couple of times. What's the yes. difference uh, between kosher salt and regular salt? A lot of campers wanting to know the difference in how you pick which one you're going to use. So I'm not going to get into how salt is made because there's a million types of salt and they're all harvested or produced in many different ways. I'll say this. Um, table salt or fine salt that you shake on your food in a restaurant that you probably have some of at home is extremely high in salinity. And that's a fancy word you can go around and use to your friends like the salinity level of my soup was very high. It just is a fancy word for saltiness or salt level, the salinity. Like when you're at the beach, the salinity of the ocean water is very high. Um, for kosher salt, I find the salinity lower. Meaning I can use a lot of this and it still will never be over salted. I call this the workhorse salt that keeps forgiving, no matter how many little mis sometimes you over season, sometimes you under kosher just says, relax, sit back. I've got, you know, I've got leather seats and air conditioning. Take your time. Um, I have a giant bowl of kosher salt in my kitchen. The only other salt that I keep out, and this is unsponsored and not a commercial is a flaky sea salt. I like Malden, M-A-L-D-O-N. It's a flaky sea salt. I use the kosher salt for all my base cooking, baking, pasta water, soups, stews, and then I finish stuff, roasted vegetables, fish, meats, with a crackle of this sea salt. That's it. The table salt, I find I add it and everything just gets super salty. And you know what? When you make something over salted, it's hard to bring it back. If it's under salted, you're good. You can just add some more. But once you go over, and that table salt is really powerful, too much horsepower. You don't need a sports car at home. You need a minivan to get your family around. <laughs> Kosher is that lovely little minivan. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, listen, I, I know people are patient. They wanted to, obviously a lot of food questions, but here comes a, here comes a television question for you. Sure. Uh, your favorite Chopped episode that you were on? Any memorable episodes that you feel really huh. kind of... That was, that's a question from Samantha, by the way. My favorite... I don't know if I have a favorite episode. I'll tell you that the very first Chopped tournament 
there were two contestants and I remember their names. So that that's, I mean, the show has been on 12 years. So for me to remember, to, it's Jason Zuka and Madison Cowan. They were the first to, to battle it out to be the first CHOP champion. And their episode, I cried for days, not just during the whole episode, but for days after. Um, for the way they cook, for what they made, for their creativity with the ingredients. By the way, take a little tablespoon of your batter and drop it in your hot oil nice and easy. Um, Madison Cowan made a waffle cone tartare with gooey duck clams. And I ate it. I think I ate it 11 years ago. And I still remember it. By the way, I'm dropping tablespoonfuls of this batter nice and easy, not near each other in the oil, right? And drop it gently in. Submerge your spoon in the oil and let the batter kind of gently fall off the spoon and into the hot fat, if that makes sense. These are pretty rustic. These are, bless your heart. Oh, they've got a little, they're misshapen and human looking. And my oil's at about 375 right now. My first batch, I have six dumplings, six dumplings, six fritters in there. Um, so it was the way they cooked. It was the first championship. It was, um, I had to chop the final person and pick the winner. I was the judge that, and it was the first time I kind of had that responsibility. Um, I think my elimination speech was like 10 minutes long because I just, <laughs> I couldn't say enough. I was like, and you remember when you were three and your mother said, <laughs> I went on and on and on. And the loser, Jason Zuka, who was wonderful, was equally exhilarated to kind of participate in this moment of history. And that kind of chef-like humility in the face of losing, um, I found that inspiring. So that's another reason. Can you guys see how this batter's just coming out? These little fritters. And then they're hot, right? And they've still got a little oil and that's when anything will stick. So that's when you add your little bit of salt and a tiny bit of that brown sugar and you just kind of let that brown sugar kind of melt over these. The brown sugar really picks up on the corn. You don't have to use the brown sugar if you don't want to. If you're, or you could drizzle a little bit of honey or agave right over it. You see, I'm just frying another batch now. Say six at a time. Every once in a while, check the temperature of your oil because as you cook the fritters, you'll find the temperature drops. Keep that oil at at least 350 or up to 375. And if it gets down to 325 or 300, heat it back up stick a thermometer in there, take its temperature, and then keep frying those fritters in little batches. And you can see those guys. And then literally, I mean, you made homemade fritters for people. I just don't think you need to do much more than just say to somebody, oh, hello, how are you? Good to wow. see you. Love yeah. that. Those are gorgeous, Alex. So we have our soup. And we have our fritters. I don't know what more I can do, like a little dance. <laughs> but there's so much you can do with corn. You can also just boil it and eat it. People ask me, how do I eat corn just straight up? Um, my fiance likes to grill and brush it with all butter. I, got, I boil it in water with a little, little bit of sugar and water um, and salt. Um, and sometimes I just savagely eat it just like that with nothing on it. Um, you can brush it with a little bit of brown butter. You know, just brown a little butter and a little, but I think a dash of honey, a drizzle of molasses, a little agave, a little sugar, a little something that just evokes more of the sweetness and then something salty. You know what else is great is corn with fish sauce. Oh my God, this fish sauce and brown sugar. I can't, we're gonna have to do another class. We're gonna oh have to gosh. do that, another, we another corn class. We so much to learn about corn. It's incredible. I know we're coming to the tail end. We did have a quick poll that we wanted to put up just to see what campers thought. Uh, we're gonna put that up right now to see what your favorite way of eating corn is. You'll see that question come up. Go ahead and give us a response and we will let people know. Wow, hundreds, uh, the numbers are going crazy. It looks like, uh, can't say who the winner's gonna be yet, but let's let those numbers get together and we will announce that. Uh, Alex, we basically gave him a choice of corn on the cob, caramel cream corn, popcorn or corn bread. And it looks like, Corn on the cob is going to be, yep, corn on the cob is the winner. So thanks, Cam, yeah. for sharing that. Wow. Um, not I'm surprised. not surprised. Not the surprised. Texture. Although popcorn, I would think, which was a strong second. I 
a mm -hmm. that was a contender for sure. I don't think of popcorn as eating corn. It's like its own food group right. of corn. Which I don't think it's fair. 3,500, over 3,500 products made with corn. It is really an incredible invention. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Enge engineered, which is really kind of cool. So I'll be, a, I'll be honest, uh, I, as, as sinful as it is to say in front of all these people, corn syrup in baking it does a lot of little things. It's a stabilizer. It's a, it's, it's a stabilizer more than anything. In so many cases, it just brings so many things home, but I don't like to admit it, you know, like I want to pretend I'm using the nectar of the gods, you know, cold <laughs> on a mountaintop, but honestly, a little corn syrup, never a bad thing. Well, Alex, everything you touch seems like it's coming from the gods. You have such a great love and passion for cooking, and you express it in such a beautiful, humorous, and enjoyable way. And I, I really, so. really want to give you a huge thank you. I don't want to let you go yet, because I, I know there'll be one or two questions, but I do want to Please. give you a huge thank you for spending all this time with us on your Saturday during the summer. Um, of course. Corn is really something exceptional to work with. You taught us great skills, some great mad skills for the kitchen. And I know you love corn, and so it certainly wasn't painful for you. So Alex, thank you, thank you so much. So Alex, there is one question that um, somebody asked that I thought was super interesting. It's if you could see any two chefs in the history battle it out for bragging rights as an Iron Chef, who would you name? I mean, probably Gordon Ramsay and Bobby Flay. That'd be my answer. Wow. One last question, then Michelle has asked the question, if you could have dinner anywhere in the world tonight, where would you go? Oh, man. Assuming no COVID, she said. Of course. Um, you know, I, wor I know it's going to sound kooky. I worked in a restaurant in Paris for seven years at Guy Savoy, or Guy Savoy. He has a restaurant in the Caesars Palace in Las Vegas as well. Um, but he has a restaurant in Paris in the 7th um, called Guy Savoy. I know. He was up all night thinking of the name. And I would go there because I haven't seen him in years. He's probably my most important mentor. I've wanted to visit him. Um, we've been corresponding. And uh, that would be the most meaningful thing I could do tonight. I would go have some artichoke soup in Paris if I could. Wow. wow. And I'm that probably sounds... going to have a tuna fish sandwich at home. Thanks a lot. <laughs> all right, Alex, you've been super, super gracious with your time. Campers, you guys have all been super gracious with your time. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Of course.